For historical context about Lebanon and more about Maronite Catholics, we turn to the head of the American Maronite Church in the eastern United States. We travel to Brooklyn, New York to speak to the eparch or bishop of Our Lady of Lebanon Maronite Cathedral. In the U.S., the Maronite Church is divided into two dioceses, one in the west and one along the east coast, which has 45 parishes from Maine to Florida. This beautiful place of worship is the Maronites' mother church in the eastern United States. That's where we spoke on the record to Bishop Gregory Mansour, who has led the diocese since 2004. Tell us about the Maronite tradition. I don't know if there are Catholics around the world who don't realize that we have other um, traditions that are part of this global Catholic Church. Yes, yeah, so when we talk about Christianity, there are Protestant Christians, there are Orthodox Christians, and there are Catholics. And the Catholic Christians, of course, but the Catholics have an amazing unity built in because we have Peter, the Holy Father. So the major church is the Latin church, which everybody knows about, and they call that the Roman Catholic Church. But the Maronite Catholics, the Ethiopian Catholics, the Coptic Catholics, the Armenian Catholics, I don't want to forget anyone, but there are <laughs> 23 different Catholic churches in communion with the Holy Father. And we call it the Catholic Communion of Churches. So we have already this amazing unity among ourselves. And that we're praying and working for unity with the Orthodox and one day unity with the Protestants. Is there any difference in the spirituality, in the belief, or is it something else? So when we talk about a, a Catholic, these 23 Eastern Catholic and the one Western Catholic churches, the same essence of faith, but a very different expression. Let's talk about St. Charbel, this oh. wonderful name oh in the Maronite gosh. tradition. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about this monk who is so, so loved. He's a little bit like uh, Padre Pio and a little bit like uh, Teresa Lisieux. They never mm. left their place, but they're all over the world. A great <laughs> devotion. In fact, um, uh, Cardinal Dolan was a, a large donor, wanted to put a shrine to St. Charbel at St. Patrick's, and he called me, Greg, what do you think? So I said, you know, your eminence, your place will never be the same. <laughs> and certainly the people come from all over. They ha everybody has a great devotion to St. Charba. We don't know how it happened, but Charba was a monk and a hermit. He had a deep devotion to the Eucharist. In fact, he died. He had a stroke by offering a stroke, and then several days later he died. In the middle of a consecration, he had yes. a stroke, right. Yeah, and he, a deep devotion to the Eucharist, deep devotion to Our Lady and a faithfulness to his monastic life. So when the patriarch came to dedicate at St. Patrick Cathedral, he looked around and he said, to him, for a man who never left Lebanon, here he is on Madison Avenue in the middle of Manhattan oh, as a sign to call of all of us in the modern city back to a deeper contemplative union with Christ. And a deeper understanding of the Eucharist, which is so timely, timely. with the Eucharistic revival and Euc Eucharistic coherence being something we're talking about all the time. Exactly. So a saint exactly. for us he here is, in the U.S. Yeah. as well. Um, the political and economic reality in Lebanon. I know that you go there. Uh, you do a lot of church work there. Tell us, what is it that the church is doing or can do or should be doing in Lebanon? Think of everything that the government should be doing <laughs> and not doing <laughs> and the church is doing hundreds if not thousands of Catholic institutions serving the poor, Catholic schools, 321 Catholic schools, a couple dozen hospitals, nursing care facilities, drug rehabilitation centers, charitable works, St. Vincent de Paul, uh, Caritas Lebanon. Mm. They're there uh, in the, with the most vulnerable and the people on the peripheries of society and the church is there with no back, but back up by the government. And so I tell people all the time, if you love Christ, if you love the church, if you love Lebanon, invest in these Catholic institutions. Don't let them go bankrupt. So going deeper into the political reality of Lebanon, give us some background on the founding of this country, why it's so meaningful for Catholic, Christian, Muslim relations. Thank you for that, that question. This is one of my favorite themes, if you don't mind. So after the Ottomans decimated that whole area, especially with Christian populations, in 1919, the Maronite Patriarch, with a few of his Muslim and Christian counterparts, went to Versailles, France, and urged the Allied leaders 
to carve out of greater Syria a portion to call it greater Lebanon. And interestingly enough, that those boundaries included Shiites in the south, Sunnis in the north, Druze in the middle, all the Christian communities. And Munsi, this to me is powerful. And it's lost on so many people today. Lebanon is one of the last Christian Muslim convivialities. There are Christian feast days, Muslim feast days. Only Lebanon has a Christian Muslim feast day, mm. the Feast of the Annunciation, March 25th. So Lebanon's specificity, its mission, its nature, John Paul II got it right when he called Lebanon is more than a country, it's a mission. Mm. So for me, it bothers me when people think Lebanon's special calling is just like any other nation. It's not. And if we lose this Christian Muslim conviviality, we are forever lost. And I'd hate to see that happen. It's definitely something that we uh, know the Pope has focused on. Pope yes. Francis and the, the Holy yes, Father has. has done a lot yes, he to has. reach out to the Muslim he community. He has. You know, he did the... He, yes. For instance, he did uh, a visit to the Grand Imam, uh, Al-Azhar, in Egypt, and he developed a good rapport with the Sunni Muslims through him. And when he went to Iraq, he visited uh, in, uh, Al Sistani. Yes, Sistani. And with that visit, he, he made an open door to Shiite Muslims. So he did for Islam what John Paul II did for Judaism, which he reestablished the bonds of friendship. And, and, uh, and hopefully, this will be a brighter future for people who have a sincere religiosity whether as Catholics or Muslims. So there's something troubling about that because when you look at the Muslim majority countries, there's a lot of great persecution of Christians within them. Oh my God. There's it's, a lot of... It's very sad to say that, but it is true. In Muslim majority countries, Jewish citizens, Christian citizens are often seen as second class citizens. And in most of those countries, they have fled. Just Lebanon is left. And in Lebanon, there's something very beautiful. A Muslim person can be judged by his own courts with Sharia law. And so can a Christian person by their own law when it comes to family matters. But it comes when it's civil and criminal, it's by the state. But, but, uh, and in this sense, a person is respected in the his own person. faith. The full person, right. religious freedom. Right, right, right. And if you don't have a robust religious freedom, as we're losing here in the United States, unfortunately, if you don't have a robust religious freedom in other places, people lose. Their identity is lost. So in thinking about this tension between friendship with the Muslim community and also the reality of the importance of learning how to live with each other, uh, but not being persecuted. What is your personal message? What is your personal desire in what Catholics should be doing when they think about Christian Muslim relations? I think so my experience with Catholic Relief Services and with Caritas Internacionales is so beautiful. In all the different communities where they served, 120 different countries, you had Christians and Muslims working charitably for others. Whether the population was Muslim or Christian or Hindu or Buddhist, I saw that. And so I feel strongly that Lebanon still has that. And we have to find a way to, to work. There's lots of work to be done in charitable work. In Afghanistan, for instance, there were 300 Catholic Relief Services people serving in Afghanistan. Yes. To me, that's beautiful. It was a 99% Muslim country. In many places in Africa, there are Catholic charities and Catholic uh, universities and Catholic schools and Catholic outreach. It's just very beautiful. Muslims tell me, when they know that I was serving on Catholic Relief Services Board, they said, thank you because you've done so much for our people back home. Because of our understanding about the human person and human dignity, human dignity. we allow them to be who they are and yes. we hope that they'll allow us to be who we are. Yes. Bishop Mansour, it's such a treat to be chatting with you. <laughs> Thank and you. we'll be following the issue of Lebanon closely. Thank you. Thank you.